More a little later on in the program. Right now, though, I want to introduce you to a man. He was born in India of British parents. He was educated as a scholar of Greek and Latin at Eton College and Cambridge University. He is also has a fellowship in ancient and modern philosophy at King's College. Uh, he also studied Hebrew and Aramaic, both at Cambridge University. He studied Hebrew at the University of Jerusalem in Israel. And in addition, he speaks a number of other modern languages. And in his spare time, he's written about 40 books. He's here tonight. Please welcome a, a gentleman that I've admired for a long time, for a lot of years. Please welcome the author of Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting, Mr. Derek Prince. God bless you, sir. Thank you for coming. Delighted to have you with us on the program. I remember hearing about you years and years ago. I remember the first time I ever heard you speak with that uh, quite proper British accent. And something happened to you while you were serving in the British Army and it changed your life. That's right. I was a professor of philosophy, called up into the forces, took my place in the British Medical Corps, which was really not my career. And uh, I decided I, I had to study something, so I took my Bible with me, or rather I bought a Bible and took it. Now, you were not a Christian at this time. No, no. In fact, how did you feel about the whole concept of Christianity and God at well, that time? Well, I was a life? philosopher, so I thought this is one branch of philosophy, you know. So I thought, well, while I've only got one little bag, I can carry things around. Now I buy a Bible and read it through from beginning to end, because then I can pronounce on Christianity. Well, I bought a Bible. The first night in the army, I started to read it, and I never anticipated. I became very conspicuous because people don't normally sit down on the bed and read the Bible in the British Army. <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't understand the book, but I said, no book's going to beat me. I'll read it through to the end. Well, after about nine months, I was in the middle of the book of Job, and Jesus revealed himself to me very directly, powerfully, personally and totally changed my whole life overnight. Well, I mean, uh, <clears throat> most of us don't have those kind of revelations. What do you mean he revealed himself to you? Well, I mixed with some people called Pentecostal. I'd never heard about them. I didn't know they existed, but they, they used strange language, which I didn't <laughs> understand. So one night I said, I'm going to pray until something happens. And I had no idea what I would expect to happen. Well, I, I prayed a long while and nothing was happening. Why did you decide to pray? I mean, what was it? I mean, you're a philosopher and you're reading the, this dusty old book. <clears throat> Why would you suddenly decide to pray? Well, I felt there's something there that I don't have that these people have. So I prayed and for an hour, all I did was sit on a stool and put my elbows on the window sill and try to pray and I couldn't pray. And then something began to happen to me. My arms started to go up in the air. My head went up, and I got frightened. I thought, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next. And then I said to myself, if I go any further back, I'll fall off the stool. <laughs> and I did. And I still had my arms up in the air, and I was saying to the Lord, more and more, more and more and more. And he took me very seriously. He just changed me totally. I read in, in Genesis about... Jacob wrestling with an angel. And he said to the angel, unless you bless me, I won't let you go. And I found myself saying to this unknown person, unless you bless me, I won't let you go. And when I got to that, I got more and more determined. I said, I won't let you go. I won't let you go. I won't let you go. And then the power of God came all over me. And I ended up on my back on the floor while there was another soldier sleeping in the same room, a friend of mine, fortunately. And I lay there sobbing for about an hour, and then my sobs turn, turned to laughter. And this, this was outside my whole idea of philosophy. <laughs> and I began to laugh very softly, and then I laughed louder and louder. And I thought to myself, what will happen when somebody comes in and finds me in my underwear on the floor <laughs> with my arms in the air <laughs> laughing? Well, Isn't that just like God to take a proper British philosopher, throw him on the floor in his underwear and tickle him? <laughs> so the only person who woke up was the other soldier. And I can remember looking over the top of my head. He reluctantly got out from his mattress 
and walked slowly towards me, rubbing his hands <laughs> and saying, I don't know what to do with you. I suppose it's no good throwing water on it. <laughs> and my something inside me said, even water wouldn't put this on. So I had this life-changing experience. Next morning when I woke up, I was a totally different person. The previous night, I didn't know how to pray. The next morning, I couldn't stop praying. Wow. And everything in my life changed from that point on. You know, there are philosophers watching this program. There are people who are you know, extremely well educated who tune in every now and then. And one of the things they think is that Christians are crazy. They are people who lack, you know, intellectual prowess. They have no educational backgrounds. And, and they really are looking for a crutch to get them through life. Yeah, well, I had an educational background. I mean, I had the best education that Britain had to offer. I was a scholar of Eton, that's the most prestigious school where Prince Charles is just graduating from. And then I was a scholar of King's College, Cambridge. And at the age of 24, I was elected to the governing body of King's College, Cambridge, which is, was high, as high as I could climb in that time. Then I got plunged into the army, <laughs> and it was all spoiled. <laughs> And then you met Jesus Christ. That's right. And two things came out of that. The one, I guess, what were the two things that came out of that? Well, my whole purpose for living was completely changed. I just wanted to know God better and serve Him. And then God, very specifically, a little while later, called me to be a teacher of the Scriptures in truth and faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus for many. And that's been my life ever since. Knowing that Jesus is real and the Bible is true. That's right. And being able to communicate it. God has given me an ability to communicate. And I've dedicated it to the Lord. And as I think you, you know, I've got about 40 books I've written in my spare time. <laughs> and uh, my radio program is heard in at least 15 different languages. Some of my books are translated into more than 60 languages. And uh, we now have Derek Prince ministry offices in 15 different nations. I have never tried to do it. It just came out of my doing what God told me to do. Which was teach the Word of God. That's right. If you have, you know, there are people who have prophetic uh, emphasis in their ministries. Others have uh, miraculous ministries like Benny Hinn and others have various kinds. Would you say that there is a particular uh, thrust in your teaching? Is there a particular heart throb that God's given you? For well, the army transferred me to the land of Israel. And when I was there, God gave me a supernatural love for the Jewish people. And so I have focused at times on God's plan for Israel. And God's plan for Israel is central to the whole Bible. Any Christian who doesn't know what God is doing with Israel is half in the dark because that's the key to understanding prophecy. It's the key to understanding what God is doing in the world today. In 1948, on the 14th of May, I was living in the center of Jerusalem when the state of Israel was born. Wow. One of the most dramatic experiences in my life. And uh, I, I just thank God that he, I'm not Jewish. He opened my eyes to see his special place and plan for the Jewish people. How do you respond to those people who say that modern day Israel is not uh, God's Israel or the Israel of the Bible? Yeah, well, I think they're mistaken because God said He would restore Israel, but in unbelief. Some people have the attitude, well, if the Jewish people really believed in Jesus, then God would restore them. But God is working the other way around. You see, God deals with Israel as a nation. And they were scattered to more than 100 nations. And now, by a miracle as great as the Exodus, they've been gathered individually from at least 100 nations. And God is going to deal with them as a nation in their own land. The prophet Hosea says, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. So God is bringing them back, mostly in unbelief, in order to deal with them there. So you believe that this exodus in reverse that we're seeing, people getting, migrating back to Israel is all part of God's 
last day plan? It's as much a miracle as the exodus from Egypt. It's a different kind of miracle. You think of all the pressures that have been put on the Jewish people to assimilate. Persecution, threats of death, every kind of pressure. And at the end of 2,000 years, they're still Jews. My first wife was Danish, and she loved the Jewish people. And she said to me, Derek, if you scattered the Jews among the nations and came back for after 200 years, you wouldn't find the Danes among the nations. You wouldn't find a single Dane anywhere. They'd all be assimilated. And the Jews have been scattered for 2,000 years. They've never been assimilated, in spite of tremendous pressure, even threats of death. It's a miracle. It's a different miracle from the first exodus. It's just as great a miracle. But it's the prelude to what God is going to do in the next few years. Which is? He's going to change the heart of the Jewish people. <laughs> Paul likened that to the resurrection from the dead. Exactly, yeah. That's right. That's what it is. And Do you see any uh, evidences of that? Any inklings of... Oh, yes. When I first went to Jerusalem in 1942, you could hardly find a Jewish believer anywhere in the city. Today in Israel, there are at least 7,000 Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow, that's more. Right there in Jerusalem. Whoa. That. Oh, well, we could, we could talk about that all night, but we've got so many things I want to ask you about. I just uh, were, was fortunate enough to get a copy of your book, Husbands and Fathers, and, and, and that is a powerful book about men, husbands right. and fathers. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems we're facing in American society, particularly in American society, the absentee father. That's right. It's not one of the problems. It is the problem. It's the root of all the other problems. It's the root of the breakdown of the family, and the breakdown of the family is the root of all other social problems that we are encountering in America today. Now, you realize that's a very politically incorrect statement. That's right. I'm politically incorrect. <laughs> so, so, you really, so you believe that the problems that we're facing in society at large really have their basics, their basis, the foundational premise is the absentee father. Why? Well, it's the breakup of the family. The breakup of the family. Oh, well, we could, we could talk about that all night, but we've got so many things I want to ask you about. I just uh, were, was fortunate enough to get a copy of your book, Husbands and Fathers, and, and, and that is a powerful book about men, husbands right. and fathers. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems we're facing in American society, particularly in American society, the absentee father. That's right. It's not one of the problems. It is the problem. It's the root of all the other problems. It's the root of the breakdown of the family, and the breakdown of the family is the root of all other social problems that we are encountering in America today. Now, you realize that's a very politically incorrect statement. That's right. I'm politically incorrect. <laughs> so, so, you really, so you believe that the problems that we're facing in society at large really have their basics, their basis, the foundational premise is the absentee father. Why? Well, it's the breakup of the family. The breakup of the family. But that, the father is the one responsible for the family. And so when he fails, usually the mother steps in, God bless her, and tries to take over. But she wasn't made to be a man. And so the whole family becomes dysfunctional. And the children very often become rebellious. They're very disillusioned. They've seen their parents divorce. They don't believe in marriage. They've looked at the church and say it isn't doing what Jesus did. So we have a generation of disillusioned young people on our hands. And I'd do anything I could to reach them with the truth. In fact, God has given me the privilege. I've been invited to be the opening speaker at a meeting that's going to be held in Washington, D.C. on 2nd of September called The Call which is calling young Christian Americans to Washington, D.C. for a day of prayer and fasting on behalf of the nation. Nothing political. Absolutely. No N politics. No agendas. We'll even pray for President Clinton. Just <laughs> prayer 
and fast, <laughs> including prayer for the president. Yeah. Well, we have to. The Bible says pray for all in authority. One of the problems in America is that American Christians haven't prayed for their government the way they should. Well, we're so mad at it sometimes. That's we get right, so mad at the they, government. But be, we shouldn't. We should be praying for that. That's government. right. You can be Some mad people at, say it's our fault that the government is like right. this. Partly. It's, it's a major cause. Paul says that, first of all, intercession, prayer, and supplication be made for kings and all in authority. And that's the first item on the prayer list of the church. Whew. Read my book. <laughs> this one. Prayer right. and fasting. Yeah. Change. Th this book must be 20 years old. It is, at least. And you're saying it's at the forefront of a major move, 400,000 young people coming to... I believe it'll be more than 400,000. I believe revival is coming to America. Amen. Christians can change the world through these, you're yeah. saying, in this. Within limits. I mean, God has got certain limits beyond which we can't go, but within those limits, we have a lot of choices, and uh, we need to exercise them. I, I love the American people. I'm an American citizen by choice, and American people have been so good to me, but I tell them, listen, I've never lived in a nation where Christians criticize their government the way the American Christians do. Why don't you pray instead of criticizing? Well, I guess we all have to plead guilty to that. <laughs> but it's a lot easier to criticize than it is to pray. That's right, I agree. But the, the easiest route doesn't get us to the place you want to be. How does one go about, I mean, praying? But how do you pray for the government? I mean, do you pray, Lord, get them Democrats out of there and get some Republicans in there, or? <laughs> no. <laughs> I pray ready for the fear of the Lord to come upon this nation. A wholesome fear and respect for the Lord. After all, America was conceived in faith in the Bible, the Lord Jesus, and God. I mean, that's a historical fact. Unfortunately, for various reasons I don't need to go into, many of the educational institutions today downplay the influence of the Bible in this land. I was actually invited to go to, where is it? You know, the pilgrims? I mean, you have to know, for the British, the pilgrims are dropouts. I mean, yes. they just <laughs> sail westward and disappear. But I was asked to go to Plymouth, Plymouth, Massachusetts, and celebrate the 250th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims. Well, I thought, that's wonderful. I don't know anything about them. So that's how that book got written. I decided to find out. The more I found out about the pilgrims, the more I respected them. I envisaged them as rather doddery old men with gray hair. I discovered most of them were under 30. They were keen, lively intellects. They had a good educational background, and they were people with real commitment. And I say to you, dear American people, discover your roots. Well, you would have to be kind of young and vigorous to take off one of those little bitty boats and that's sail right, across the right. ocean back in those days. I mean, they didn't have to have the Queen Mary with that's all right. the staterooms. Absolutely. I mean, you had to be a pretty vigorous guy to yeah. dumped on the shores here. Yeah. I mean, this was, I mean, this was worse than Florida. I mean, this whole place was a, was a jungle back in those days. Yeah. Although, you know, pr practically a forest. Yeah. And now let me ask you this, because just recently the Supreme Court, in fact, just today, um, or yesterday, they passed, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that prayer could no longer be used by students. Student-led prayer could not be utilized any longer at athletic events. Well, shame, on, shame on them. That's all right. Separation of church and state. That's ridiculous. That wasn't in the mind of the people who devised separation of church. That's why we criticize the government. See, that's <laughs> well, you're free to criticize, provided you pray. Pray for, pray after you criticize, then pray. <laughs> but, but that really wasn't in the mind of the no, founding fathers. No, they didn't think that way at all. They were saying... And think of justifying pornography on the basis of the right of freedom to speech. I mean, it's a total perversion of the whole purpose of that provision. It really is. I mean, they, they say that you have the right to speak filth but you can't pray. That's right. Something is 
upside down somewhere. Right. Well, there are very evil forces that are trying to destroy America, but I don't believe they're going to succeed. Well, I sure applaud that. I hope that. <laughs> now, you didn't talk about this, and we didn't talk about this, but I saw uh, one of the 40 books that you'd written, one of the gentlemen upstairs had it, it was, it was about casting out demons. Or, now, when you talk about very evil forces, are you talking about demonic forces or demonic Well, powers? demons are the small change in Satan's kingdom. They're the infantry. There are all sorts of other higher beings, angelic beings, fallen angels, rebellious angels. But you have to learn to deal with demons because they're the, the way that Satan approaches most people. And I, I mean, I've got plunged into this. I had no intention of giving a, becoming a demon chaser, but I'm glad I am. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? I, mean, uh, I must ask you. How well, did that happen? I encountered people with tremendous problems for whom I could find no other explanation. And I started to deal with a dear woman who was the secretary of a Baptist church and had eight demons in her. I mean, she was a good American housewife. Well, I, I, I can't go into all the details, but these demons confronted me. They challenged me. I commanded them to come out. They said, we're not coming out. When the first one came out, it said, even if I come out, my brothers are here and they'll kill her. And eight different demons, and I, there are several witnesses to this, eight different demons came out. The last one was the spirit of death. And when that came out, she was stretched out on the floor on her back. Her face was colorless and her skin was cold and clammy. And she looked exactly like a dead person. She lay there for about 10 minutes, put her arms up in the air and started to praise the Lord in tongues. Wow. Now. At one point, that was really popular. They even had, you know, demon ministries, people chasing demons around. But that's kind of drifted off into, you know, now we're into, you know, prosperity and everything is rosy and that sort of thing. But we're still just as much at risk to satanic wiles as we were before. Yes. Millions of people in the United States. You know, I spent a lot of time in Africa and other countries. So people say, well, of course, in Africa they have demons. I tell people I've encountered just as many demons in the United States as I ever encountered in Africa. Get out of here. We don't have demons in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> I mean, I didn't get into this subject to be popular, but when I get hold of a truth, I'm not going to give it up. I mean, I, and I've seen, I can say, thousands of people wonderfully delivered from demonic oppression. I'm not going to stop. Can a Christian have a demon? Definitely. Can a Christian be demon possessed? No. That's the problem. The phrase demon possessed isn't in the Bible. It's a translation that should never have been used. And what shocks me is the NIV, which is a good modern translation. When it comes to that word, it says demon possessed. The Greek word is very simple. It's a demonized. It's exactly what it is in Greek. Anybody can be demonized, but they're not possessed by the devil. Jesus owns them, but there are areas in their personalities where the Holy Spirit is not in control. So you can have a demon. Yeah, but I, it's not something I'm ambitious to no, do. No, I understand that. <laughs> but can you, how do you get rid of it? Do you have to find an exorcist, or is there ways Well, that you can read, read, read. read. <laughs> <laughs> read my book. <laughs> I wrote the book because I couldn't tell the thousands of people that wanted to know all individually. So I've got a very vivid description of what it's like to have need deliverance from demons, the conditions you have to meet, and the prayer you have to pray. We've got the copy of that book. Give me, give me get a, let me get a copy of that book. He's got the book. I want to show it on the camera so when people go into Christian bookstores, they can find it. And uh, give it to that lady right there. She's got it. And she'll bring it up here. I want to show this. This is the book we've been talking about. Yeah, just come on up here, and we'll just show it right here. There you go. Hey, a little live television here. This is, they shall expel demons. What you know, need to know about demons, your invisible enemies. This is not on the show tonight. This was not scheduled to be on this program. But uh, that just kind of popped But up. you had it on your show a little while back. You know that. Ah, there it is, right there. You can find this in Christian bookstores all yes, around, all around America. the country. Yes. They shall expel demons. That's the same as cast out demons, right? I use the word expel 
because it's not religious. Yeah, in other words, if you inhale something you don't want it, you expel it. Well, that's the same with demon. Don't let get in this mysterious religious atmosphere. It's not real. Outstanding. I, way to go. Let me ask you this. Um, you talking about how much time you spend in America. You've got offices in 15 countries. And at one point, that was really popular. They even had, you know, demon ministries, people chasing demons around. But that's kind of drifted off into, you know, now we're into you know, prosperity and everything is rosy and that sort of thing. But we're still just as much at risk to satanic wiles as we were before. Yes. Millions of people in the United States. You know, I spent a lot of time in Africa and other countries. So people say, well, of course, in Africa they have demons. I tell people I've encountered just as many demons in the United States as I ever encountered in Africa. Get out of here. We don't have demons in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> I mean, I didn't get into this subject to be popular, but when I get hold of a truth, I'm not going to give it up. I mean, I, and I've seen, I can say, thousands of people wonderfully delivered from demonic oppression. I'm not going to stop. Can a Christian have a demon? Definitely. Can a Christian be demon possessed? No. That's the problem. The phrase demon possessed isn't in the Bible. It's a translation that should never have been used. And what shocks me is the NIV, which is a good modern translation. When it comes to that word, it says demon possessed. The Greek word is very simple. It's demonized. It's exactly what it is in Greek. Anybody can be demonized, but they're not possessed by the devil. Jesus owns them, but there are areas in their personalities where the Holy Spirit is not in control. So you can have a demon. Yeah, but I, it's not something I'm ambitious to No, do. I understand that. <laughs> but can you, how do you get rid of it? Do you have to find an exorcist, or is there ways Well, that you can read, read, read. read. <laughs> <laughs> read my book. <laughs> I wrote the book because I couldn't tell the thousands of people that wanted to know all individually. So I've got a very vivid description of what it's like to have need deliverance from demons, the conditions you have to meet, and the prayer you have to pray. We've got the copy of that book. Give me, give me, get a, let me get a copy of that book. He's got the book. I want to show it on the camera so when people go into Christian bookstores, they can find it. And uh, give it to that lady right there. She's got it. And she'll bring it up here. I want to show this. This is the book we've been talking about. Yeah, just come on up here, and we'll just show it right here. There you go. Hey, little live television here. This is, they shall expel demons. What you know, need to know about demons, your invisible enemies. This is not on the show tonight. This was not scheduled to be on this program. But uh, that just kind of popped But up. you had it on your show a little while back. You know that. Ah, there it is right there. You can find this in Christian bookstores all yes, around, all around the country. Yes. They shall expel demons. That's the same as cast out demons. Right? I use the word expel because it's not religious. In other words, if you inhale something you don't want it, you expel it. Well, that's the same with demons. Don't let get in this mysterious religious atmosphere. It's not real. Outstanding. I, way to go. Let me ask you this. Um, you talking about how much time you spend in America. You've got offices in 15 countries, and you're kind of an international world traveler. Are you going to continue your overseas missions? Are you going to broaden that, expand that, or are you going to spend more time in America? Well, this summer I'm committed to be in six or seven different nations. One of the most exciting, I mean, it really excites me, is I'm scheduled in the second week in May to speak to 1,000 Iranian Christians in Holland. They're all exiles from their own nation because of their faith. But I want to tell you, something is going to explode in Iran. Wow. And in the Middle East. That, are we getting close to that time? I don't know how close, but I hope I'll live to see it. I'm 85, so I mean, give me another five years. <laughs> <laughs> Five years? Well, I'm not, that's not a prediction. That's just... Absolutely. But I have so much more to do. I tell the Lord, don't take me home till I've done my job. Well, he's not. I mean, he gave you this job to do. He's not going right. to put you well, in the middle of it. I think we have to cooperate with the Lord. We have to learn to live healthy lives. 
America. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the way we eat here, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't leave it out. <laughs> We're not going to discuss that topic. Demons we can cast up, we leave in mashed potatoes alone. <laughs> <laughs> is there, I mean, has God given you a current, I mean, something really burning on your heart for like right now for America, for the church, or for the world? Yes. It's care for orphans, widows, the poor, and the oppressed. I mean, I am the head of an adopted family of 150 persons. I have eight, uh, 12 adopted children. so. It's not that I'm lacking things to do, but I have seen out of Scripture, right through the Bible, righteousness, practical righteousness, is caring for orphans, widows, the poor, and the oppressed. And the problem with us Pentecostals is we're so afraid of a religion of works that we have a religion that doesn't work. Mm. So what James talked about, true religion and undefiled before God and the Father has to do with widows and orphans. Absolutely. And listen, I've been Pentecostal for 60 years, and I've heard all sorts of sermons. I've never heard a Pentecostal sermon challenging us to care for orphans and widows. Not one, wow. except ones I've preached myself. Wow. Well, we're so afraid of we're not, saved, we're not saved by works. This is not a religion of works. But I want to tell you, the faith that saves us works. If yeah. we've got a faith that doesn't work, it doesn't save. Wow. <laughs> so the most significant message that you say that God has given you for today is widows and orphans and the oppressed? Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm passionate about it. And especially single mothers. I don't believe the church is fulfilling its obligation to single mothers. So they should? They should love them, practically. Take care of their children. Now, are you talking Christian welfare, or are you talking something different? Uh, Christian welfare is all right. I'm talking about just really loving people and doing something to show your love. I think it'd be much more effective if it wasn't all done through institutions. People don't need a program. They don't need an institution. They need a person somebody to show them love. Wow. What did you, you, you I, mean, I had to go back to this, but you mentioned the term in your book, renegade man. Yeah. What did you mean by that phrase? Because that has to do with- I mean men who failed in their two primary responsibilities. Number one as husbands, and number two as fathers. And they've run off and done all sorts of other things. They've become bank presidents and golf champions, and I don't know what else, but they have fail to do the two things for which they're going to have to answer God. Which is one of the reasons we have these single parents in many that's cases. That's right. No, that's more than one reason. And I mean, women have some of the responsibility too. But there is the solution. Solution is in some, one simple word, love. And if God we is. really love people, we'll do the right thing. Wow. God is love, isn't he? That's right. What's next for Derek Prince? Any exciting assignments that God's given you for? Well, there's this assignment to preach to the Iranians, and then I'm going to Benin in West Africa to a French-speaking conference because I want my videos and tapes in, translated into French. And then the really exciting thing is the call to be, to have the privilege of in some way addressing, I think there'll be half a million wow. young people there. Oh, pray it's a million. My goodness. Uh, amen. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed by God's grace that he's given me these tasks. You mentioned a moment or two ago that you were 85 and you're looking forward to seeing maybe, hopefully, the Lord will come back before you, he translates you out of here. No, I don't think that. I think I'll, he'll take me before he comes back. So are you going to retire? Are you saying Derek Prince is retired? I've never read about any servant of the Lord in the Bible who retired. <laughs> <laughs> a 
love. You, you make it so simple. That's what I'm here for, to make it simple. My whole pr understanding is if I can't say it simply, it's because I don't understand it clearly. And I work at it until I do. You know, I was a friend of Corrie ten Boom, you know her little phrase. Yes. Kiss, K-I-S-S, -S, keep, it, keep simple, it simple, saint. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we call them saints, we don't <laughs> Keep it simple, saint. Yeah. But that's just exactly what's needed. Dr. Prince, it has been a real pleasure seeing you and talking to you and hearing what God's doing and has done over the years. I mean, if you could look back and say there's one thing that I most appreciate that God's given me the opportunity to do, I don't want to use the word pride, but if there's one thing you could say, I get the most joy out of knowing that God's given me the privilege of doing this life. Can you put a finger on something? Well, I would say God has given me two wonderful wives. Not at the same time. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> One after the other. And I'm just so grateful to God. Uh, I mean, I treasure the memory of each of my wives. I remember the first one when she passed. That we were, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. And then you're, but I didn't know your second wife had just yes, recently passed. At the end of 1998. Wow. Mm. Hard experience. Yes, it is. But the Lord carried me through. Well, you have certainly been a blessing to the church at large and made an impact on literally the nation, shaping history. You had your part in shaping history Thank through you. prayer and fasting. Thank it's you. been a real pleasure. Thank you for being God with us tonight. God bless you. What I a pleasure. God bless you, sir. Dr. Derek Prince. Quick reminder.